Welcome to In the Studio. Today's theme is equity in education, and I'm Tom Adams, a member of the Davis School Board. Equity in education is the challenge for all schools and classrooms throughout the state and Yolo County, and, it, and Yolo County is no exception. The forthcoming dashboard, the new accountability tool, will show many districts, even the most successful ones, will need to improve efforts in addressing the needs of English learners, foster and homeless youth, students with disabilities, and students of poverty. With me today to discuss this, this issue in education is Garth Lewis, Assistant Superintendent and incoming Superintendent of Yellow County Office of Education. Jackie Wong, School Board Member in Washington Unified. Kevin Williams, Classroom Teacher at Davis Senior High School and creator of the Race and Social Justice Curriculum. So with this theme, what I want our panelists to think about is, what do you see as the immediate need to address in Yolo County, specifically in terms of either the classroom as a school board member, or in terms of the Yolo County Office of Education? Sure. I would say the first thing that I, as a, as a classroom teacher, that needs to be addressed is just awareness among our student population. Um, especially, I teach at Davis, Davis Senior High School, and while our student community is very diverse, I think the vast majority of students don't think it is diverse or they don't see that diversity. And I th the biggest challenge for me as a teacher is getting them to be aware that these issues that you mentioned in the opening exist not only on our campus but within our classroom, within their peer groups. It can be delicate in how to do that, uh, uh, but with the race and social justice curriculum, it's, it's built in and it is kind of part of what we do during the year. As a matter of fact, that's part of what we're tackling right now in class is beginning to think about these issues that you brought up and how do we investigate the extent to which they exist on our campus and in our community. Yeah, so you find your students are pretty welcoming once they're faced with the challenge and willing to delve into these issues. Absolutely, they're, right. they're very welcoming, but I, as with adults not and students, it's a matter of education. It's a matter of the very first thing you need to do is make them aware that it's there and then you have to begin teaching. So the making them aware is probably the easiest That's part. Right. It's, right. it's how you get them to deal with meaningful change or what they can do on campus um, as students, but also encouraging adults on campus, teachers and administrators to take on and do the heavy lifting to help these underrepresented groups. That's great. So. Jackie, you're on a school board, so how, you know, taking a, a broader view in terms of working at the district level and being a board member, what do you see as, from your perspective? So stepping back a little bit, I think that it does start um, in the classroom, but I actually ran off of fulfilling the promise of the local control funding formula, which is actually California's major education reform system, so that we would focus on the population that you had outlined in the opening statement, right? Um, Washington Unified has the benefit of being selected as one of the California School Board Association equity network partners and kind of diving deep at that school board level. Um, how do we as leadership and governing board fulfill this promise and understand the data, right? right. And how do we actually authentically engage community partners um, with kind of the diverse backgrounds that they have, including students, um, and tell the story of the data in a way where people don't feel left behind. Diversity is the beginning. What we're mm -hmm. learning about um, uh, from each other in the SCSB equity network is that it, the root cause, cause is, uh, is racism, right? The institutional right. racism that has been created um, right. long before, um, before we, we were on boards or, right. or in the classroom, right? And how do we unpack that in a way right. and tell the story of what we see today in terms of educational inequities that exist within the system, right. um, academic or otherwise, or social emotional, are rooted in that and begin to use the data to unpack that, to invest in a way, um, strategically uh, invest in a way that will actually produce the changes that we want um, as, as intended by the local control funding formula. So for me, is I think that a lot of times at the school board level, what I'm, what I'm seeing is that folks are so used to the NCLB punishment model mm -hmm. of using um, 
using the data in the way where you would reconstitute classrooms and you would close down school districts. And, um, and historically, I've been in, you know, I have worked in one of those school districts, and that's just not very uplifting at all. When you actually mm -hmm. think about what well, the opportunity of LCFF is that it should be community-centered, student-centered practice, but using the data in a way so that we, as school board members, invest in a way that um, builds upon the strengths of our classrooms, our communities, and our teachers, right? And right. so using that as a continuous cycle of improvement, understanding what equity means, why are, are some of our students of certain demographics being suspended and pushed out more than right. other students? Even though we may have diverse cultures on campus, talking about it is the beginning, but then we have the responsibility as a governing board to unpack that, that data in a way that makes it very transparent to the public and actually engaging the public and bringing them into our school district and our our LCAP planning, so local control accountability plan um, efforts, um, so that we make the right investments that's community driven to change that for our students. So that's, uh, from my lens, the opportunity before us. So when the dashboard comes out in December, do you think there'll be any surprises or are you pretty much anticipating you know, results that you've seen in your assessment data? So we... Um, there aren't, from my lens, there aren't right. a lot of suspi surprises. Um, okay. And I think that the having seen some of the kind of what might be coming out, that it makes it a little bit more transparent for the public. So right. the question for us as a school as a school board is how do you take that and maybe actually create bring it to the community forums that we are, are having coming up to explain it to to the community, the students, and others about what this really means, right? And this is actually a look back. So remember, right. the data is based on past, mm -hmm. uh, past performance, right? So the incoming cohort of students isn't necessarily, that, that isn't the data of the students that you're teaching right now. Mm -hmm. So again, how do we use it and reiterate the fact that it's, it's a planning tool, right? right? To fully engage and, and be transparent with where we are in terms of educational progress for all of our students, because we want all of our students to succeed. Right, but if we only if we don't unpack the data, we will continue to perpetuate the systemic kind of um, inequities that have existed again, as I've mentioned before us. So for for me, the dashboard, I think I, I'm, I'm hopeful, um, but it takes really kind of what you were uh, you were saying is like we need to kind of go to the core of why we're doing this and have a really deep understanding of LCFF and equity mm -hmm. from from our personal kind of where we are rooted, and then that translates to our staff and, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, right. so Garth, what, you're now at the county level, so you know, what, how would, what would you add to this in terms of sure. the county role? So one thing is that I, I think about this work um, with sort of two, two things in mind. Uh -huh. uh, one is a, a quote from Edward Deming, mm -hmm. who stated that every system is designed to get, a, to get the exact results that is right. that is getting right. So that's that's one issue, and then the other is the uh, definition of equity uh, mm -hmm. that I'm borrowing from uh, Dr. Jeff uh, uh, Andrade, which uh, paraphrasing essentially is uh, calling us to give people what they need when they need it. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a timeliness that's that's associated with this work. And so, as I think about the the first quote as it relates to the system, uh, I I am not going to be surprised. Uh, about the results that we're getting, uh, because they historically we've seen the same um, student groups in as we as it relates to uh, outcomes, educational outcomes, whether it's on uh, the top end of the spectrum uh, related to graduation rates or college and career readiness, or the idea of who's at the top as it relates to reading and and math scores, and those who are in 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 the most need uh, historically. That um, that particular demographic, uh, those that demographic outcomes, have not shifted significantly as a as a system, and so for for us from a county perspective, the big question is how do we support system leaders okay. in really in, in interrogating their system uh, practices, their leadership practices. Uh, and what the data are telling telling us that we need to uh, uh, to shift in those practices in order to get a different result, right? And so the and in addition to the accountability measures that have been uh, identified by the state and that will be shared in this this uh, upcoming release, 
what are the other data that mm -hmm. we need to take a look at that should also inform our practice? Um, primarily, I, th I think about this in terms of qualitative mm -hmm. data as well. And so taking a look at how are we engaging with those that we intend to serve, the youth, the families, and uh, taking into account those lived experiences in how our systems adjust the, um, the methodology that we utilize at the classroom level and the leadership decision-making level. And one of, the, one of the structures that we are using at the County Office of Education um, to engage in this work is the Professional Learning Network, the, right. the PLN, okay. uh, where we engage with district superintendents and their executive leadership uh, in really, again, interrogating best practices, looking for root causes, um, and being vulnerable and explicit about the work that we need to do in order to reach those, those populations that historically um, we, we haven't done a great job with in public education. Right. So, I mean, this is real interesting for me in terms of we've talked about interrogating practices, meaning, you know, really kind of mapping out what, what you are doing. Are you getting the intended results? Sure. We've talked about root cause analysis. And so, and then we talk about supporting the teachers ourselves. And so I'm just wondering in terms of what do you, all of you see as kind of the new initiatives or new practices we should actually start doing um, based upon the, the data that we have now and will be coming out? I mean, how will it, how will it change your practice? Well, I'll say one of the areas um, that we are looking to do a, a better job in is really looking for impact. So as a county office of education, one of the things that we do consistently is offer professional learning opportunities, mm -hmm. as, as well as convenings of various stakeholders related to specific themes. So for example, um, on October 30th, mm -hmm. we partner to host the uh, um, Building a Resilient YOLO Summit, right. uh, engaging stakeholders from various youth and, and family serving uh, agencies and entities where we need to really in, um, improve our practice is looking for impact on their practice. Right. So as a consequence of participating in a professional learning experience, uh, how do we tie that learning experience from the professional to what actually is happening in the classroom? We know from research that the, that the, uh, the largest effect size uh, largest predictor for student outcomes and, and increased student academic achievement is the efficacy of that classroom teacher, right? right? And so one of the areas that we will be exploring, uh, and for our own accountability as a county office of education, is how do we ensure that the uh, methodology we're using for professional learning actually supports improvement of practice okay. at, at the classroom level. So, Jacqueline, real quickly, what do you think Washington Unified will do to address um, this? We actually echo that sentiment. We actually made a major investment these past couple of years on professional development, mm -hmm. um, ensuring that our classroom teachers get the time that actually a, a lot of teachers are requesting with one another to learn best practices and to look at the data and to share um, kind of what they know to be, you know, to, be to, uh, to support improvement um, for their students. So that I really do echo that really, um, yeah, that, I think that's that's key, right? We we need to support our both are actually classified and certificated, right? We need to hear from them. We need to they, they are the leaders in those classrooms. They know what those students need, and so right. creating kind of set time every single Wednesday for us, we've made that investment okay. um, in in our teachers. Uh, in in addition to that, we've actually also when we've looked at the data, we've looked we we understand that we needed to improve in our special education subgroup as well as our English language learner subgroup. So we've right. actually restructured that to make sure that it's aligned with the best practices, um, both both in special education and English language learners. We've made a significant investments um, monetarily in our LCAP and redesigned both programs because um, a couple years ago we looked at the data and we knew that we needed to do something different. So, yeah. so Kevin. How do we help you best? Well, it's been really interesting to listen uh, to both of you, uh, Garth and Jackie, because what I think, hearing what you're saying, is what we should be asking our students to do. You're very reflective people. Your jobs ask you to reflect on data and trends, try new things that aren't working, that ha or try new things because things haven't been working in the past. And I don't think, as 
classroom teachers, we do that enough. Um, I'm not even talking about reflecting on, on my, what I do as a teacher, but asking students to, it should be built into a social studies classroom that there's an applied nature to it. You're learning all this for reasons, cause, so you can solve problems. And I think, in the, especially in, in the climate that we, we live in, the political climate of the 21st century, that we need to engage active learners. And take something like the dashboard that you've been talking about. I don't know what that is, and I think it sounds like it's got some great data in it that students might, especially in the RSGA classroom, be able to look at and see trends that could click onto their brain, into their brains and go, that's something I'm seeing on campus. And we've got this, we, you know, because in RSJ they go out and they do surveys. They, right. they, mm -hmm. they investigate the nature of problems. They create, they get databases that you almost have like an army of, sure. of survey mm -hmm. writer or uh, data collectors on campus and they care so much about it. And I think what we need, I would like to see us do is marry, make it more visible to, to, teachers and students what you do and maybe make that connection so that we're not, I think we might be doing the same things, yeah. but not knowing that we're doing the same things. I mean, you're doing them in a much deeper way than I'm doing it, but one, one other thing I think of asking students to do some of that investigation is it empowers them to see themselves as changers of the community and the environments that they live in. And as a teacher, I, I always say it, it's the most proud moment every year when they present their data because you see that they've owned something that they've created, yeah. mm, that they've had a part yeah. in, which is a lot yeah. deeper learning than I can regurgitate yeah. information from a textbook or a lecture. Yeah. So if we could, I don't want to jump in. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> we're running out of time, but if I could just kind of summarize for all of us, I think we're realizing that none of these problems can be resolved by any one entity or one person. Absolutely. It takes really a community effort is what I've heard, whether it be educational leadership at the county level, uh, the important role of trustees in explaining these issues to the public and bringing parents along, and then the important role of the teacher inspiring students to address these. So thank you, um, all of you, Garth and Jackie and Kevin. Um, this has been a very nice forum and definitely stimulating. We could have gone on longer. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, feel free to write me and I'll be happy to forward them to our guests to get your uh, questions answered. Um, the, in terms of the, uh, this issue of equity in education, definitely we'll be there with Yolo County, Washington Unified, Davis Joint Unified, and all other schools in Yolo County addressing the great needs of, a, of resolving inequities in our system and making sure that we have a fair and free education for all our students. So thank you, and thank you for tuning in to um, In the Studio. <laughs>